Good afternoon and welcome. Um, a sl slight display of science. We're going to be mic'd here and here, and our speaker will also have a body mic. So if nothing else, you should be able to hear us uh, through the marvels of science and technology today. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome and to make this introduction. Now, I was one of those kids, like I suspect some in this classroom, for whom science was a very intimidating matter in my formal schooling. And in my observation of people who write about science today, uh, you very often find they are writers for whom the subject matter evolved over time. Our visitor today, uh, quite differently, uh, knew of this uh, propensity and this uh, interest in the subjects we call science very early on, and in fact went to the Bronx High School of Science in New York City, one of the leading such places in the country, if not in the world. And her evolution over time as first a science reporter and then a science journalist and finally, the author of extraordinary works uh, has been all of a pattern now stretching over a lifetime. And so she brings to our gathering today extraordinary gifts. And among those gifts are the ability to take subjects that we would ordinarily shy from or find dusty and academic and difficult and tedious and bring them to life and give them meaning with an elegance and a grace in writing that one ordinarily perhaps associates with other forms of written expression. But in common with everyone who takes a pen, our author today does what is the end objective of all writing and that is to communicate and to communicate truth. Uh, there's information, there's stories, there's all of that, but it doesn't work if at the end it doesn't communicate some truth. And uh, in the most recent works especially, all of that is very much on display. Her career spans uh, many, many years at the New York Times. Um, she has received many of the major awards that recognize accomplishment in writing on sub subjects of science. And um, her uh, more recent books have found their way to um, uh, translation into not only other languages, but into other forms. And so that if you are um, uh, a viewer of Nova, you have seen the translation of the first extraordinary work, work of, of subject about navigation uh, into something that literally was uh, the kind of book and then the program that could not be put down. So it is an extraordinary uh, uh, career an extraordinary uh, level of accomplishment. And um, it is a great pleasure to welcome her here today. She is a, a resident here in East Hampton uh, of many, many years standing. Uh, she has been described uh, very rarely for someone in her genre as a master storyteller, uh, as someone who brings science to life, uh, and who has taken dusty academic subjects and put, turned them into rich, gripping page turners. It is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Davis Sobel. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction. I have to slip on the other microphone. I um, was going to read from Longitude or Galileo's Daughter, but then I started thinking about my life, especially my life before 1995, when I crawled out from under a rock as <laughs> the author of this book. And I thought, I had 25 happy years as a working journalist. And that's really what I would like to talk to you about today, because everything that went into those books came out of that time. And I, I made a list of some of the more fun things that happened to me in that life. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the time I was a freelance uh, magazine reporter. 
and uh, I actually convinced the editor of Travel Holiday to send me on an eclipse cruise and uh, got to write about that and witness a miracle. I went to space camp. I, um, I toured the field outside Roswell, New Mexico, where the saucer reportedly landed. And uh, as science writer at Cornell, I visited the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico at least three, I think four times, and was there when the telescope broadcast its interstellar message to outer space. Um, at the Times, I was really only at the Times for two years, uh, full time as a science reporter, but those were eventful years. Um, my beat was called human behavior, but when I told that to someone once, he laughed at me. He said, nonsense. Every reporter covers human behavior, <laughs> which is true. Uh, so after that, I referred to it as psychology and psychiatry. Um, <laughs> in that capacity, I was volunteered as a human subject in a research project that required me to live in a laboratory for 25 days without knowing what time it was. After that, they sent me to the hopeless ward of a state mental hospital to work as a volunteer. One thing I did learn through this is you never have to lie about what you're doing. Um, everybody at the mental hospital knew I was a reporter, and it only took about one minute for them to forget that. And uh, because they needed the help too badly. And nobody was afraid to talk to me. Um, I was also named in a million dollar libel suit for an article I didn't write. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to write B.F. Skinner's obituary. And that's one of the pieces I would like to read to you. The Times had a policy of preparing obituaries in advance because you really don't want to have to do that in a hurry on deadline. I had to do that when Eric Fromm died and I swore I would never let it happen to me again. I was responsible for the obituaries of everyone on my beat. So when I saw that there was no advance obit for B.F. Skinner, I got right to work. And there was a technique for doing this. You, you wrote the person a letter and said that you wanted to prepare a detailed biographical sketch for future use. <laughs> and they knew what you meant. But still, it was awful. I mean, you really do feel like the Grim Reaper going up there on this assignment, and I was very anxious about it. I did a tremendous amount of homework. That would be my other advice to you. Do your homework. Um, you were really supposed to have read everything that the person had written and be familiar with research. And um, when I arrived at his office, he immediately asked me if I had come to write his obituary. So I said yes. And he said, oh, I'm so relieved. Because, you know, one worries about these things. And he was in great good spirits about it. And the thing I remember best about my visit there, which I, I tried to write into the obit, and I, I think I did, but the editors took it out. He must have been in his lab earlier that morning because he actually had a tuft of pigeon fluff in his necktie. <laughs> and, um, and during the day when students would come to see him, he was always very polite and he would introduce, say, this is Ms. Sobel from the Times, she's here to write my obituary. <laughs> and they would blanch and choke. Um, but I was quite comfortable by that point. And then the best part was, of course after I went home and and wrote it, I sent it to him, and he corrected it. <laughs> so that when, uh, well, I'll tell you that later. Let me, let me just read it to you now. The reason obituaries can be done long in advance is the part that says the cause of death and the date of death is just the merest detail. I mean, anybody could put that in later. The hardest thing is the opening line where you try to encapsulate everything that the person did in a lifetime. So we'll see what you think. B.F. Skinner, America's preeminent psychologist who studied human and animal behavior 
in ingenious experiments and hoped that his findings would foster creativity and curtail repression, died Saturday at Mount Auburn Hospital in Cambridge. His daughter, Julie F. Vargas, said he had remained active to the end and died of complications arising from leukemia. He was 86 years old. In his research and his voluminous writings, including Walden II and Beyond Freedom and Dignity, Dr. Skinner advanced the belief that individuals could understand themselves and build a better world only through systematic modification of their behavior, according to scientific principles he promulgated. By becoming a behaviorist in the late 1920s, when the discipline was in its infancy, Dr. Skinner helped to shape behavioral psychology as both a laboratory science and a cogent philosophy. Over the course of his long career, he worked on projects as diverse as machines that teach, utopian communities, warheads guided by pigeons, temperature-controlled environments for infants, and the education of the severely retarded. Some of these contributions earned him the reputation of a profound thinker, while others caused him to be seen as a cold manipulator of humanity, whose ideas could have disastrous consequences if they fell into the wrong hands. All human beings are controlled, he once told an interviewer, but the ideal of behaviorism is to eliminate coercion, to apply controls by changing the environment in such a way as to reinforce the kind of behavior that benefits everyone. Because he denounced the mysterious world of the mind as an unwarranted and dangerous metaphor, Dr. Skinner became further suspect as a person who had no truck with moods and feelings as they are described by other psychologists or for that matter by ordinary people. In fact, however, he recognized and reveled in the whole range of human emotions and wanted to explore them without resorting to mentalistic concepts such as conscious and unconscious or artificial distinctions between the mind and the brain. States from joy to suffering, he maintained, were experienced as physical states of the body and made manifest in a person's behavior. Even thinking was a behavior, no matter how difficult to observe and describe. Though officially retired from his teaching duties at Harvard University since 1974, Dr. Skinner for years walked the two miles to his office in William James Hall every day to lecture, direct graduate research, write, and conduct experiments in which pigeons learned to act as if they were communicating with each other and being aware of themselves. <coughs> By his own and others' reckoning, Dr. Skinner's most important achievement was his full explication of the theory of operant behavior. Briefly, it holds that any behavior, from a rat's pressing a bar to the steps in composing a symphony, is selected and reinforced by certain positive consequences in the environment. In other words, new behavior that emerges accidentally as a combination of the individual's unique genetic and personal history may readily become established as a pattern by positive reinforcement. If not reinforced, however, the new behavior tends to be extinguished. Once established, a behavior may be sustained by a variety of different schedules of reinforcement, as Dr. Skinner described in his 1938 book, The Behavior of Organisms. These schedules ranged from fixed ratio schedules, such as the piecework rate of pay in industry, to variable ratio schedules, characteristic of all gambling devices and systems. In lotteries, Dr. Skinner was fond of pointing out, as an example, the most inconsistent and infrequent positive reinforcement serves to maintain the behavior of buying lottery tickets. Dr. Skinner defined a positive reinforcer as anything that strengthened a given behavior. A negative reinforcer reduced or terminated it. Although positive and negative reinforcement have frequently been confused with the notions of reward and punishment, they are actually, as Dr. Skinner defined them, quite different. Dr. Skinner's was a world without punishment. Though punishment worked as a negative reinforcer, it served only to produce escape or avoidant behavior that might be even more undesirable than the behavior it was designed to punish. He considered punishment ineffective in training animals, teaching children, 
or managing public offenders. Dr. Skinner also interpreted private events, what he called the world inside the skin, according to behaviorist lines of thought. He conceded a debt to Sigmund Freud for showing that behavior obeys certain laws and is due to underlying causes, but he rejected Freud's mental apparatus as a complete fabrication. He chose instead to study the interaction of the individual with the environment. Widely used educational and psychotherapeutic applications of behavior modification grew out of Dr. Skinner's work. To teach the learning disabled through successive approximation, for example, desired behavior such as walking or dressing oneself was analyzed, broken down into its simplest components, and each step in the process reinforced <coughs> appropriately until the individual had mastered the task. Dr. Skinner first demonstrated this technique with animals in 1937, after reading about an experiment in which almost human chimpanzees earned poker chips to be spent on food and other treats. Dr. Skinner wanted to show that the same behavior could be elicited from an animal not at all anthropomorphic. <coughs> I decided to teach a rat to spend money, he wrote. Poker chips would be hard to handle, and I chose glass marbles instead. The rat was to release a marble from a rack by pulling a chain, pick the marble up, carry it across the cage, and drop it into a tube standing about two inches above the floor. I could not, of course, wait for this complex sequence to appear before reinforcing it. I had to construct it step by step through successive approximation, each step being something the rat would do at the time so that it could be reinforced. He named the rat Pliny the Elder. <laughs> Pliny was awkward as he walked across the cage with the marble in his paws, Dr. Skinner reported, but I could see no other difference between him and the chimpanzee. When not very hungry, he would occasionally pull the chain to release marbles, which he did not immediately spend, though I doubt whether he was hoarding money for its own sake. Applying the principles of successive approximation and reinforcement to education, Dr. Skinner demonstrated how quickly students could learn to read with programmed instruction on teaching machines that reinforced correct responses. He was proud of the fact that children of different races and ethnic backgrounds were shown to learn at the same speed in such a program, regardless of the language spoken or the literacy level at home. However, the teaching machine never quite caught on. Born March 20th, 1904, in the railroad town of Susquehanna, Pennsylvania, Dr. Skinner spent his childhood exploring the surrounding countryside with his younger brother, writing stories and poems, and dreaming up elaborate plans for new inventions, such as an endless source of energy from a water-powered perpetual motion machine. Later, he would design all of the apparatus used in his many animal experiments and build most of it himself. His initials stood for Burris, his mother's maiden name, Frederick. But he was called Fred, and sometimes Red, because of the color of his hair. Dr. Skinner attended Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, where he majored in English, wrote for the literary magazines, and dreamed of becoming a novelist. But despite encouraging words on his short stories from Robert Frost, Dr. Skinner discovered within a year of his graduation in 1926 that I had no reason to write anything. I had nothing to say. <laughs> All that changed, of course, when he chose a new career on the basis of reading several articles and books about an emerging theory called behaviorism. Though he lacked any formal background in psychology, his short stories had all paid careful attention to human behavior. And so he applied to Harvard in 1928, determined to become a scientific psychologist. Harvard awarded him a master's degree in 1930 and a PhD the following year. Grants from the National Research Council enabled Dr. Skinner to continue his experiments for two more years, at which time he was elected one of the first junior fellows at Har of Harvard Society of Fellows. This position allowed him another three years of investigations in his university laboratory. In 1936, just before he started teaching duties at the University of Minnesota, he met Yvonne Eve Blue, whom he married after a very brief engagement. It was Halloween, Dr. Skinner recalled, of the weekend the couple suddenly decided to wed. 
and the only cakes available for the reception were decorated in orange and black. A local minister was found. Hearing that I was a, psych a psychologist, he asked whether we minded if he mentioned God during the ceremony, and we said we did not. <laughs> Dr. Skinner eventually wrote his novel, Walden II, in the 1940s, while he was chairman of the psychology department at Indiana University in Bloomington. The book sold poorly for several years, but after appearing in paperback, it attracted wide attention and has sold about one million copies and been translated into eight languages. Presented as fiction, Walden II was really a social commentary. It described a visit to a behaviorally engineered community where jealousy, malaise, and class struggle had been replaced by rewarding work and unlimited artistic expression. Some readers saw the book as consonant with the mistaken popular image of Dr. Skinner as a man who would sacrifice his own child to science by keeping her in a box designed for laboratory animals. People still write to me, Dr. Skinner noted with stung disbelief in an interview, to ask me if it's true that I raised my daughter in a cage. In reality, the so-called Skinner box, which was an experimental environment for rats or pigeons, had nothing in common with the baby tender he designed for his second daughter. The latter was an enclosed crib with its own thermostat control that kept the child warm without confining layers of clothing or blankets. Although magazine articles at the time implied that the child was left to fend for herself in the box and perhaps even experimented upon there, Dr. Skinner she said she spent no more time in it than other infants did in their cribs and playpens. When Deborah was about two and a half years old, Dr. Skinner moved the abandoned baby tender to his laboratory and converted it into a living space for pigeons. He preferred pigeons to rats as subjects because they lived much longer, and therefore the effort to train them was rewarded for years. He began to work with them during World War II when he designed a homing device for America's only guided missile. His idea was to condition pigeons in the nose cone to peck at the target image and steer the missile as it descended. The wartime Office of Scientific Research and Development funded Project Pigeon, but as the birds performed in increasingly difficult circumstances, engineers and physicists working on the missile grew ever more skeptical. At its final presentation in Washington, the Pigeon homing device was met with patronizing smiles, laughter, and anecdotes about other animals. A government official conceded that the apparatus was suitable for a wide range of visual targets, used no materials in short supply, and could be put into production within 30 days. Yet, Dr. Skinner recalls that he and his colleagues were dismissed with the suggestion, why don't you guys go out and get drunk? <laughs> Despite the dedication he showed to the project, Dr. Skinner hoped that the broad application of behaviorist principles in society would put an end to war by making the world a cooperative rather than a competitive environment. In 1947, Dr. Skinner was invited back to Harvard for one year as the William James Lecturer. He returned permanently in 1948 as a professor. In 1980, in a debate staged by the American Psychological Association in Montreal, Hans J. Isink, the noted British psychologist, acknowledged that B.F. Skinner was one of the most widely misunderstood scientists and he wondered aloud how he bore the strain. I find, Dr. Skinner replied evenly, that I need to be understood only three or four times a year. <laughs> Dr. Skinner considered Verbal Behavior, published in 1957, his most important work, although it did not enjoy the popularity of some of the others. It was the missing link, he said, between the scientific account and the personal interpretation of human behavior. In his free time, Dr. Skinner liked to lose himself in a good mystery story, read plays and other literature aloud with his wife, paint, and enjoy music. Although he gave up the saxophone as a young man because it seemed at the time to be the wrong instrument for a psychologist, he continued to play the piano, clavichord, and organ until well into his 70s when his eyesight grew too weak to read music. At 78, 
Dr. Skinner addressed the 1982 Convention of the American Psychological Association on intellectual self-management in old age, offering himself as a case history. To cope with failing memory and diminished intellectual powers, he told the psychologists, the brain should work fewer hours and give itself more rest between exertions. If you want to continue to be intellectually productive, you must risk the contempt of your younger acquaintances and freely admit that you read detective stories or watch Archie Bunker on TV, Dr. <laughs> Skinner said. Dr. Skinner's many awards and citations include the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award from the American Psychological Association. Oh, there's a long list of these. Um, Mrs. Vargas, his daughter, said that Dr. Skinner had received a Lifetime Achievement Award in Psychology last Friday from the American Psychological Association and gave a 15-minute address concerning his work at its opening session in Boston. She said her father had remained very active. His latest book, Recent Issues in the Analysis of Behavior, was published in 1989. Dr. Skinner is survived by his wife, the former Eve Blue, two daughters, Mrs. Vargas, a resident of etc., etc., and two granddaughters, Christine and Justine Vargas, who were raised in the commercial model of the Skinner baby tender. <laughs> Mrs. Vargas said it was her father's wish that there be no funeral. When, um, when this piece came out, this ran as a page one story, which was, of course, a big thrill. But I was long gone from the newspaper at that point. Um, but they were kind enough to uh, give me a byline. And I got mail on this piece. I got mail from some of Skinner's colleagues saying that it was the first time they'd seen the theory of behaviorism explained correctly in the popular press and that Fred would have been pleased. I said, Fred was pleased. That's why it came out right. <laughs> so, um, uh, the, the other piece I want to read to I, I usually don't do readings because I, I think, I really think it's hard to listen to without going to sleep. But I'm going to do it anyway. And if you're tired, just feel free to doze off. We won't, we won't wake you. Um, this was a story. This was not my idea. I, I, I really love figuring out fun stories to approach. Um, Longitude began as a magazine article. I was never intending to write it as a book. And in fact, after all the magazines I worked for rejected the idea as the most boring, esoteric uh, subject I had ever suggested, and who would want to read about that? Um, I wasn't sure it could even be a magazine article, um, but it was. But this, this uh, story came to me uh, as an assignment from Audubon Magazine. And the idea was to interview Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, a Florida writer who had been very involved with the preservation of the Everglades. She was 101 years old. And um, they wanted me to have a lot of time with her, a minimum of three hours. But because of her age, she explained that it would just be too difficult to sit in an interview for three hours, and could we do one hour a day for three days? So the magazine agreed to let me spend that much time there. And since they didn't want me just frittering, they arranged for the local Audubon Society to fly me over the Everglades in a small plane to really get a sense of the place. And I told this to my friend Diane Ackerman. Uh, and she got so excited at that prospect. She said, I'm going to come with you. I'll pay my own way. You have your time alone with Marjorie, but I, I want to be on that plane ride. So she did come. And the morning of the trip, we got to the airfield and walked into the ladies' room. and a blonde goddess was, was in there. And she looked at us. She said, oh, are you the ladies from the magazine? I'm your pilot. I'll meet you outside. So Diane turned to me. I mean, this is what two liberated women, how two liberated women behave. <laughs> Diane turned to me and said, that bimbo is flying the plane? <laughs> 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 
Just before her 101st birthday, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas felt compelled to take a day off work to meet with federal officials at Everglades National Park in Homestead, Florida, just about an hour's drive from her home in Coconut Grove. The meeting came up at a busy time for Mrs. Douglas, not that she's ever idle. Though legally blind, she'd been working with the help of a friend and two secretaries, trying among other things to complete her biography of W.H. Hudson, the naturalist and author of Green Mansions. But Mrs. Douglas apparently lives by the rule that when the Everglades call for her, she goes to them. This has been true most of her adult life, especially for the last 20 years. As she tells it, she became passionately committed to the Glades in the beginning of her 80th year. About the time I started the W.H. Hudson project, about the time I lost so much of my eyesight, I could hardly have seen the Everglades outdoors. Mrs. Douglas arrived for the March 1st meeting at Park Headquarters wearing her white spring coat, her ladylike Panama hat, and a single strand of white beads. A picture taken of her that day, sitting next to William K. Riley, administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, and Robert S. Chandler, superintendent of the park, appeared with a page one story in the New York Times about the proposed $700 million restoration of the Everglades. In the photo, Mrs. Douglas has her face set in an attentive yet imperturbable expression behind her thick glasses. The two gentlemen appear well pleased to be in her company, though perhaps they would be hard pressed to tell her anything she didn't already know. The only surviving member of the original 1927 committee to put the Everglades under Park Service protection, Mrs. Douglas had a hand in creating Everglades National Park, which was finally chartered 20 years later. Since then, she's engaged both hands, and sometimes both feet too, it seems, in saving the complex ecosystem of the Everglades from certain destruction by agricultural and real estate interests. She'd be the first to tell you she hasn't spent a whole lot of time tromping around the mangroves and the sawgrass. It's too buggy, too wet, too generally inhospitable. The sawgrass would cut you to pieces for camping or hiking or the other outdoor activities which naturalists in other places can routinely enjoy. Still on her infrequent visits over the years, she has witnessed the nuptial flight of the white ibis, fed marshmallows to the alligators, and walked close enough to a rare Florida panther to see the shadows of its whiskers. I know it's out there and I know its importance, she has said of the park and its environs. I suppose you could say the Everglades and I have the kind of friendship that doesn't depend on constant physical contact. Even Mrs. Douglas, an accomplished reporter, short story writer, and author of several books, never could decide whether to call the Everglades an it or a they. That grammatical confusion is symbolic of the mystique of the Everglades, singular in its uniqueness, plural in their vastness and diversity. Instead of communing with the Glades, Mrs. Douglas spoke for them in tireless efforts at public education from her position as founder and first president of the group she named Friends of the Everglades. Thanks to her devoted friendship, the Everglades seem headed for brighter days because the state, the federal government, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the South Florida Water Management District are all taking steps toward restoring the landscape now thought to be on the brink of biological collapse. This is the last battle to be won. In years past, Mrs. Douglas has rescued the Glades from plume hunters who ransacked the rookeries for the millinery trade from developers who wanted to erect bridges, suburbs, and even a jet port on the marshes. This time, she's convinced most everyone of the value of what she's been saying all along, that the Everglades must have their free flow of water restored. This has been her mantra, because the water is the Everglades. The Army Corps of Engineers did more than anyone else to disturb the course of the waters, Mrs. Douglas maintains. One of the Corps' first offenses was to straighten the meanders of the Kissimmee River into a canal in the early 1900s. This benefited the big sugarcane growers, who then polluted Lake Okeechobee by back-pumping their irrigation water into it. 
along with all the pesticides, fertilizer, dead cats, and old boots that the water had absorbed. While some environmentalists defend this or that endangered species of water bird, Mrs. Douglas clings to a radical view. It's the whole thing that's got to be preserved, she says. We've got to restore the Kissimmee River. We've got to clean up Lake Okeechobee and maintain the sheet flow of the Everglades. It follows from her simple formula that the return of a vast sheet of water inching southwestward from the Kissimmee River and Lake Okeechobee down and across 100 miles of what she calls the great pointed paw of the state of Florida out to the Gulf of Mexico will bring back the birds, the rainfall, and the many natural treasures that have been gradually disappearing from the glades over the past century. But Mrs. Douglas will have to live at least another 10 years to reap the fruits of her own hard work. One of the first things I asked when I met her was how she had managed to hold fast to her goal when it seemed she might never prevail. She answered with a question of her own. Why should I give up? It was she who divined the true character of these wetlands as a river, not a swamp, and gave the place its enduring epithet in the title of her 1947 book, The Everglades, River of Grass. There are no other Everglades in the world, she wrote then. They are, they have always been, one of the unique regions of the earth, remote, never wholly known. Nothing anywhere else is like them. Their vast, glittering openness, wider than the enormous visible round of the horizon. The racing free saltness and sweetness of their massive winds under the dazzling blue heights of space. The miracle of the light pours over the green and brown expanse of sawgrass and of water shining and slow moving below. The grass and water that is the meaning and the central fact of the Everglades of Florida. It is a river of grass. All her poetic loquacity goes into her writing. In our interview, she speaks in the clipped tones and sparse phrases of the damn Yankee she professes to be, even after 75 years in Florida. Though born in Minnesota, Mrs. Douglas was raised in New England and schooled at Wellesley College. Hers is not an impolite or impatient terseness. Rather, it has the feel of personal conservation as though she is speaking sparingly to save her own energy for the work still at hand. She consents to every public appearance, every requested photo session or television taping, out of a sense that her small, frail body remains a powerful instrument for swaying public opinion to her cause. But if her answers were often shorter than I would have liked, they did not lack for color or clarity. I asked her, for example, why she had kept her married name when her marriage to enigmatic Kenneth Douglas, a writer 30 years her senior, lasted only a brief period between 1913 and 1915, with Mr. Douglas absent much of that time. I think it's easier when you travel alone and all that to be a Mrs. rather than a Miss, she replied, hailing from an era before Ms. was invented. Yes, I agreed. There are times when it's hard to be a woman. I don't think it's hard to be a woman, she corrected me. It's a challenge. So keeping your married name was one way to meet that challenge, to give yourself protection in the world? Mm-hmm. Looking back, she doesn't regret the marriage, but she doesn't regret leaving it either. And while her autobiography candidly describes the pleasure that she found in marital relations, Mrs. Douglas has since drawn a clear distinction between being alone which she often chooses to be, and being lonely, a condition with which she seems utterly unfamiliar. I say sex is more bother than it's worth, she told me. Ever since Freud, everybody thinks they have to have sex or they'll explode with a loud noise. <laughs> well, I don't think that's true. Sex is not so important as all that. You feel that the lack of it leaves one more energy to put into other things? Yes, it does, she answered. Yes, it does. <laughs> Despite her two last names, her advanced age, and the great respect she commands, people tend to call her by her first name, and she does not object. 
new acquaintances, even strangers recognizing her in a restaurant are immediately on a first name basis with her. Florida Governor Lawton Childs, who recently decreed her birthday on April 7th to be the start of a two week state celebration of environmental awareness, was simply doing the accepted thing when he named the tribute Plant a Tree for Marjorie. Marjorie herself, mindful of the hoopla surrounding her 100th birthday in April 1990, had asked this year that people buy her no presents, throw her no parties. She wanted each well-wisher to plant a tree for her, she said. When I told her that the governor had parlayed her desire into a two-week campaign, complete with a phone number that Floridians could call to be counted among the commemorative planters, she smiled and said, how lovely. We were sitting in the large room of her small house with its cool stucco walls the color of old parchment and dark, partially exposed beams overhead. Several tabletops and bookcases supported an assortment of statues and trophies, many in the form of wood storks, herons, and egrets, awarded for her Everglades work. They were not displayed so much as set down where space allowed. One of them had been pressed into service as a hat rack. The scores of books that once lay stacked and scattered everywhere, attesting to Marjorie's lifelong obsession with reading, have all been tucked neatly in the bookcases now that she is blind. In their place, almost as many talking books, some on cassettes, some on records, covered a settee and spilled into an unruly mound on the floor. I noticed a few Dorothy Sayers titles among them, along with Graham Greene, P.G. Wodehouse, and the Norton Book of Travel. This is where you work, I said, reveling in the feel of the place. Yes, of course, she said. Where else would I? The house resembles Marjorie in many ways, spare, sensible, serviceable. She moves about inside it like a sighted person by virtue of having lived here for 65 years. The kitchen has the original appliances by the look of them, which is no great hardship for Marjorie since she's always preferred dining out to cooking. The bedroom is not much larger than the perimeter of the unmade single bed, and a window holds the cat flap through which her tomcat, Willie Terwilliger, comes and goes as he pleases. She has a dressing room next to the bedroom and a small extra bedroom where her uncle Charlie spent the last years of his life and where she put up her friend Marion Manley, who lost her money in the big land bust for several years during the Depression. It is a welcoming and comfortable home. Its high ceilings and four-way draft provide an adequate alternative to air conditioning, even in the 90-degree heat of our afternoons together. From the arched wooden front door to the small terrace out back, where Marjorie says she never spends much time because of all the work she has to do, there is nothing extravagant about this house, except perhaps for the color of the bathroom. It is positively flamingo. I commended Marjorie for her decision to build a small house without air conditioning. I asked if she'd been thinking about the environment even then, in 1926. Well, of course, she shot back. But even though she was environmentally aware far ahead of her time, she was at that moment referring to the suitability of the house to its southern surroundings. I had to be thinking about the environment. Of course I did. You couldn't build a house down here without taking the Florida conditions into account. I suggested that a lot of people had done so nevertheless. More fools they, a lot of damn Yankees. I'm a damn Yankee myself, but not to that extent. So you've been living as the Floridians do. No, I've been living the way I want to live in Florida. When she sets her jaw, her lips make a hard line that tilts up to the left, dividing her face asymmetrically. Her word for her look is crooked and she's remarked how it has grown crookeder with age. But when she laughs, she looks rounded and playful. The magazine's photographer, daunted by the darkness of Marjorie's rooms, moved a large rattan chair outdoors for his purposes. Marjorie took my arm for direction once we were beyond her doorstep, but elbowed my ribs as one might spur a horse to get me to walk faster. Then she sat still in front of the mahogany tree dripping with ball moss, and posed as directed while two, perhaps three rolls of film clicked by. I dare say that's enough, she called out, feeling the heat. But the photographer wanted to drive her out to Watson Island, 
where he could take more pictures against the backdrop of the Miami skyline. Marjorie predates the skyline, having arrived here when Miami was a town of only 15,000 inhabitants. She consented good-naturedly to the trip. How does the Miami of today compare with the town you knew, I asked en route. Oh, it's better as a big city. We have very many more privileges and accommodations. Half an hour later, I found myself walking her to a photo chair again, which this time had been set up at the very edge of a pier, not six inches from the water. A couple of brown pelicans flew down to perch on the nearby pilings as I explained to Marjorie the precariousness of her situation. Remember, one false move and you're in the drink. Oh, that's all right, she said. I can swim. Afterward, over her daily cocktail, she recounted how she'd often thought of compiling a book to be called Just One More that would show pictures of intrepid photographers in the most death-defying feats of photojournalism. My first time up in an airplane, she recalled, laughing. I flew with a photographer who went out across the wing, it was a biplane, to take photographs of the regatta down below, while the pilot maintained precisely the right angle to keep him from falling off. He just had one foot around the strut and all the courage in the world. She's written so many things in so many genres, newspaper articles, columns and editorials, poetry, short stories, novels, histories, natural histories, that a humor book about photographers would probably surprise no one. But her current project, titled W.H. Hudson, Environmentalist, is a scholarly work to be published by the University of Florida Press. In the course of her research, Marjorie traveled to England seven times. The trips allowed her to rummage through a desk full of Hudson's letters and other materials at his old publishing house, J.M. Dent, and to wander in his footsteps through Hampshire and Cornwall. She also made three trips to the Argentine, where Hudson's great niece, Violetta, became her hostess, friend, and helper, turning over more letters and family records. By the last trip to the site of Hudson's idle days in Patagonia, Marjorie's eyesight had deteriorated so badly that she needed to have a wheelchair meet her plane at the large airports. At the smaller airports be between Buenos Aires and Patagonia, she would alight from the tiny aircraft and say aloud in Spanish to no one in particular, I don't see very well, please help me. She has proved herself to be a thorough researcher who devotes at least as much time to studying as to writing about her subjects. Anyone could swear by her hard-won historical and scientific information. But Marjorie gives equal credence to her own common sense and strongly held opinions, no matter what the experts say. It was on such grounds that she vehemently protested the State Game Commission's program to put radio collars on the Florida panther. Fewer than 50 of these animals survive today in the Big Cypress National Preserve adjacent to the Everglades. They are a subspecies of cougar and unquestionably among the most critically endangered mammals in the world. The commission wanted to track their movements so as to mount better efforts to protect them but Marjorie was outraged at the plan, even before one of the rare animals died while being treed by dogs and shot with a tranquilizer dart in preparation for collaring. It was a snap decision for her, and irreversible, too, forged from observation of her own house cats. They didn't care much for collars, as though they knew they might easily snag such an encumbrance on some brush and choke and die. I don't like collars on cats. Marjorie declared. Panthers are cats, too. Her opinion of the program could be summed up as follows. I don't care what the federal and state governments say. I think it's stupid. What she did for the panther was to tell her Indian friends to stop killing them for their whiskers or bristles, which they carried in their medicine bags. It was an awful waste to kill the whole beast just for the hairs on its face, she argued, proposing a different strategy. Any panthers accidentally killed by speeding cars should be given to the Indians to use and dispose of as they wished. I'd heard they'd do that with the eagles in the West, she explained matter-of-factly. I thought the same idea would work here. People think of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas as a great environmentalist, and she is, though she came to that calling late in life and almost by accident. Certainly, she showed an early sympathy for nature, as she relates in her autobiography, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Voice of the River. 
Upstairs in the sitting room, Father read to me, mostly from Hiawatha. When he came to Hiawatha building the canoe and saying to the birch tree, give me of your bark, O birch tree, and the birch tree sighing and bending over to give up its bark, he was astonished by the fact that I burst into loud sobs. I couldn't make him understand I was sorry for the birch tree, because why should the birch tree have to give up his bark just because Hiawatha wanted to build a canoe? I couldn't stand it. I cried, and I guess Father skipped the canoe part after that. But it wasn't the love of the wilderness that brought her to South Florida in 1915. She came down here to get a divorce and to be reunited with her father, Judge Frank B. Stoneman, editor of the Miami Herald, whom she hadn't seen for 20 years since she was a child of five. Judge Stoneman was already stumping for the preservation of the Everglades before his daughter arrived. At the time, most Floridians saw the Everglades as a snake-infested swamp that would benefit from nothing so much as a thorough draining. He spoke out against draining in his editorials. He didn't have much scientific evidence to support his position, but he clung to it nevertheless, showing great foresight in his belief that the Everglades' water should be left to seek its own level. One imagines, from Marjorie's description of him, that Frank Stoneman valued the Everglades for their mere existence and their sheer beauty, for their right to be, and in this she wholeheartedly agreed with him. As it happened, a job soon opened up for Marjorie on the society pages of the Herald. Here she found her calling. She had always wanted to be a writer, had written in high school and majored in English composition in college, but it took the society editor's sudden leaving to land Marjorie in her dream career. Marjorie's native ability and the small size of the newspaper staff, which included actor Joseph Cotton on the classified ad desk, combined to push her into other beats. In 1916, during World War I, she was sent to do a story on the first woman enlistee from Florida in the Naval Reserve. Look, she telephoned her father to say, I got the story on the first woman to enlist. It turned out to be me. I admire your patriotism, he replied, but it leaves us a little short-handed. I was overqualified for yeoman work in the Navy, she told me during our interview. So she put in for an early honorable discharge and then served overseas in France on assignment for the American Red Cross. Back in Florida in 1920, she became an assistant editor at the Herald with her own column, The Galley. An editorial she wrote in verse expressing her outrage about a young man who was arrested for vagrancy and then beaten to death in a labor camp, convinced the state legislature to abolish meetings in the camps. Another cause she wrote about in her column was the establishment of Everglades National Park, and as a result, she was invited to join the park committee. Her life on the newspaper thrust her into the tumult of the growing metropolis of Miami, but the work and the pressure proved overwhelming. She left the newspaper and made a living writing short stories for the Saturday Evening Post and other magazines. She set some of the stories in and around the Everglades and never lost interest in them over the 15 years she spent working as a full-time freelance writer. She contributed to Black Mask, the same magazine that had published Dashiell Hammett's stories before he became <coughs> famous. Another of her contemporaries was Ernest Hemingway, about whom she had this to say. I didn't subscribe to the Hemingway thinking. I was more or less tied into the mainstream from which Hemingway was estranged. I couldn't write in that bare, stark way in which a story begins like a slap in the face. She wrote her own stories with style and power, as in this excerpt from Pineland, published in the Post on August 15, 1925. All around them, the white brilliance of the Florida noon poured down upon the uneven road from the burial place, caught on the bright spear points of the palmettos, and struck into nakedness the shabby houses among stumps of pine trees of this outskirt of Miami. The light and the hot wind seemed whiter and hotter for the figure of Sarah McDevitt in her mourning. Eventually she grew tired of writing stories and was six months into a novel when the opportunity to write the Everglades book literally fell into her lap. In 1941, her friend Hervey Allen, an editor at Reinhardt, offered her the chance to contribute to a series of books about the rivers of America. He suggested she take on the Miami River, 
but she protested on the grounds that it was only about an inch long. The Everglades, on the other hand, about which she still knew very little, were somehow connected to the Miami River and would no doubt make a richer story. All right, she remembers Alan saying, write about the Everglades. The only problem was the series was supposed to be about rivers. You think I could get away with calling it a river of grass? Marjorie asked the state hydrologist, the first expert she consulted in her research. He said she could, and she threw herself into the project for the next five years. The book was an enormous success and has sold 10,000 copies a year since 1947. Reading it makes its continuing popularity easy to understand. The water moves, the sawgrass, pale green to deep brown ripeness stands rigid. It is moved only in sluggish rollings by the vast push of the winds across it. Over its endless acres, here and there, the shadows of the dazzling clouds quicken and slide, purple brown, plum brown, mauve brown, rust brown, bronze. The bristling, blossoming tops do not bend easily like standing grain. They do not even in their own growth <coughs> curve all one way, but stand in edged clumps, curving against each other, all the massed curving blades making millions of fine arching lines that at a little distance merge to a huge expanse of brown wires or bristles or farther beyond to deep piled plush. At the horizon they become velvet. The line they make is an edge of velvet against the infinite blue, the blue and white, the clear fine primrose yellow, the burning brass and crimson, the molten silver, the deepening hyacinth sky. The book is not just a celebration of nature, but a detailed chronicle from the bloody skirmishes between Native Americans and European settlers in the glades to the later struggles of the wetlands wildlife against the onslaught of dams, drainage, and drought. The book reads beautifully, I complimented her. The descriptions are so lyrical that I would guess you must have written them out in longhand. I did, yes, and then I hired a typist. I did so much writing on a typewriter for the newspaper that it affected my style. So I wrote the book in longhand. I was fascinated with this revelation about Marjorie's writing process. With a fountain pen, I pursued. Oh, my heavens, woman, of course, what a question. <laughs> the book brought her great acclaim and united her name with the Everglades forever. But it wasn't until 1970, after the environmental movement of the 60s had taken hold, that the Everglades became a central force in Marjorie's existence. The precipitating issue was the threatened building of a jet port inside the Everglades. An acquaintance of Marjorie's, Joe Browder of the National Audubon Society, was working hard to oppose the plan, but with little popular support. Marjorie bumped into one of Browder's assistants in a grocery store and said she applauded their efforts. The young woman asked Marjorie what she was doing to help in the situation. Marjorie made reference to her book and Meeting a blank stare, she offhandedly said she'd try to help if possible. Browder himself came to collect on her promise the next day. Together, they hatched the idea of an organization that would take a stand for the Everglades. Marjorie was still mulling over this prospect when she met an old sailing buddy at a picnic. She asked his opinion of an Everglades support group that anyone could join for a nominal fee, say $1. It's a great idea, he said, and stuck a dollar in her hand. That was the charter membership induction into the Friends of the Everglades. By the end of the year, there were 500 members, and the ranks eventually swelled into the thousands. The jet port was never built. I learned something more of Marjorie by venturing into the Everglades on bicycle and on foot, where I found an abundance of alligators lounging all along the length of the roadways, only a few yards away from me. I stood as close as a midwife to an egg-laying turtle and spied through binoculars on an anhinga mother in an eye-level nest with two naked snake-necked chicks. From the high vantage point of a chartered Cessna in late April at the tail end of the dry season in the Everglades, I saw the miles of sawgrass looking brown and flat. The scant water was concentrated in networks of squiggly rivulets outlined in mangroves and hummocks of hardwood trees reaching up from scattered elevations in the land. Only a few teardrop-shaped islands in Rogers River Bay 
were white with egret nests. Parallel lines cut by airboats crisscrossed the sloughs, and alligator trails, also visible from above, wandered wavily across the landscape. Between the mid-morning heat and the engines droning, I fancied I saw metaphors for Marjorie in the panorama below. She is a river herself, I thought, me meandering through so many lives and times, flooding them with her good writing and good will. I had one more question to ask her. Tell me, of all the eras you've lived through, are you enjoying now most of all? Well, naturally, she replied. Your questions, please. Yes? What was Skinner's correction? What was Skinner's correction? Probably something about the definition of negative reinforcement, which I think is the hardest aspect of behaviorism to understand. But the truth is, I don't remember. Not at all. I will repeat the questions, or you can, yeah, you need the, right. A question about Galileo's daughter. Would you mind a question about Galileo's daughter was the question. Um, I have two. May I ask two? Sure. Um, the first one is very specific. What was the significance of severing his finger? Well, shall I answer that one first and then Please. you go on? Um, Galileo was buried twice. And when his body was exhumed for transfer to the second grave, certain pieces were removed, including a vertebra, which is now at the University of Padua in Italy, and the middle finger of his right hand, which is on display at the Museum of the History of Science in Florence. And these were bizarre practices of the time. Uh, it had significance to the people then. It is an interesting thing to see. I thought there was some symbolism to it when I first saw it in the museum, you know. But I don't think that that, that finger had the meaning then that it has now. So you know, was, was he giving an, an eternal response to the Inquisition? I don't think so. The second question is, um, did you, I'm sure you rewrote it once. Uh, you did so much research for the book. Did you go back and rewrite everything once you discovered the ending, which I will not divulge to anyone who hasn't read the book? I, that must have been overwhelming. Yeah, I discovered the ending before I had finished the book, well before. And in fact, when I first learned about it, I didn't think it would be the ending of the book, because I always expected the book to end at, her, at the daughter's death. Um, but then it turned out to fit in quite nicely. Um, so I was planning for it. But I, I did rewrite the entire book because my editor was not pleased with it the first time through. Um, rewriting is mostly what writing is about, isn't it? Thank you. That was, that was my two questions. Okay. When I finished the book, I was in tears. It was just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. you. Yes. <coughs> you mentioned it's on. I you, you mentioned that you were uh, a journalist for 25 years, and then you made the leap into um, books. And I'm wondering what you had to do to change your style, um, to tell a story in a longer uh, format. I had actually co-authored five books during those 25 years. So I had some experience doing that. But I was terrified at the concept the first time, because when you're used to writing short, a book seems like an endless journey. And, um, but it's really not much different. It's, it's, I think the big uh, leap is to not try to say it all quickly, to allow a pace in your reporting, and to, um, to organize it well and, and write a proposal that really lays it out. I, I have one writer friend who says that the proposal is really the most important 
part of the book. The rest is just filling in the blanks. If, if you do the proposal correctly, it just happens that way. I'm seeing a lot of people nodding. So, um, so it's, it's daunting but doable is my answer. Yes? I was actually surprised to hear that you had been able to give a draft of your unprinted story to a source for um, approval. I've never heard of that before in journalism. I, um, I was widely criticized at the Times for being too obedient to scientists I interviewed. But it has been my experience that no matter how carefully you try to report science news, you always get something wrong. And scientists are reluctant to speak to reporters for good reason. So I think it is crucial to show it to them and to make sure you got the facts right. What's, what's to be gained by not doing that? I mean, you can tell them that they can't really change the way you write, but it's in everyone's best interest to get the information straight. Have you ever I mean, had them? Um, try to make substantial changes in Yes, I have. I, I had a terrible experience once on a freelance piece I did for Psychology Today that never got published, partly because the source made such a fuss. Um, this was an article about shamanism, and I went to a workshop and interviewed this person, and I somehow, when he saw it in black and white, it just wasn't at all what he expected. He didn't like it. He threatened to sue me. We had, we had lots of um, back and forth. And finally, the magazine dropped it. Any other questions? OK. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.